it seems like a good spot to think about where we've come from and what we've achieved over the last eight months. So eight months, eight months, eight years. <laughs> Feels like it's gone fast, but not that that fast. Over the last uh, eight years, or now nine years, um, to now look towards the future and where um, we should be going in hand hygiene. Um, and the National Hand Hygiene Initiative towards um, moving forward. So I guess the first thing is to say, well, is there a future? Or have we arrived? Are we there yet? And, I, and when, as soon as I utter this sentence with two small children, all I think about is little children saying, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? But the, the, when you ask that question, you actually have to then have a little bit of a think and it really depends on a couple of things. And the first one is, what's our destination? And then the second question is, well, how do we measure it? Now, Lindsay's just talked about the effects of the, of the NHHI the last nine years and, and stole my thunder a little bit because what I was going to talk about was this slide, which was so nicely explained looking at the 70% benchmark. And if you look at the program as a whole over, the part, over that period of time, and you're using the 70% benchmark, as a nation, we could probably pretty well say, yep, we've done really well, let's tick that box. Yep, we, we just might be there. The problem with using anything like a benchmark as our indicator is also very well demonstrated by the subsequent graph, which just shows how much of a change there is just by moving those goalposts on us. And I know that I'm preaching to the converted when I talk about the impact of that and as, uh, as an organisation administrator, the impact that that may have had on you having to answer to that. Um, so if we use that as a measure, it can be quite deflating and it also can be, um, and we certainly get lots of inquiries now, a lot more inquiries now, saying how do we reach the benchmark when just not quite meeting the benchmark or sometimes we meet the benchmark but then we don't, what can we do to move forward? And so the question then really, is this a good way of us determining whether we've, we've reached that destination? And if this isn't a good way, does that mean that we should just stop looking at our data collection altogether? And I know that there's people that say, yep, we should just stop collecting data, we shouldn't collect hand hygiene data, we, you know, too many resources, etc., etc. But let's just have a little reflection on what data collection is all about. So one of the greatest strengths of the National Hand Hygiene Initiative is that it has always been based on the WHO Five Moments methodology, which is validated, it's standardised, it's directed by the guidelines, and I myself have had fights back in the day with people who wanted to remove the fifth moment, or we don't want to report on that anymore. And I used to say, well, take it up with the WHO. <laughs> While the WHO say it's five moments, there's five moments. And that has always given our program an immense amount of strength. The other part of our program, which you are all hugely involved in, is the fact that we have validated auditors. We have a very strict process for actually ending up as an auditor in our database. And that process is managed by ourselves at Hand Hygiene Australia, it's managed by the jurisdictional coordinators, and I know that sometimes it can be quite infuriating just how well that's managed when we hassle you about validation and about online learning packages, but it is a huge strength when it comes to the data. And it means that our data is reliable, and so that's one of the biggest things. Now there's limitations, which I'll discuss in a moment, but those validation processes give us a huge amount of structure and strength. The other big component is that our improvements are measurable. So as Lindsay has just done with the national data at an organisational level, you can look at your data and you can look at the improvements that have been made over a period of time. And that is a huge strength because if you didn't have a standardised manner for collecting that data, 
you would not be able to actually say that the data that you collected in 2010 was collected in exactly the same way that it's collected now. So those changes would be absolutely meaningless. So it's a huge benefit and a huge strength to the program. And I think the biggest, one, biggest strength is that the feedback that we give to our, whoever you're giving it to, our healthcare workers, but also to our executives, to our politicians, can actually be meaningful. And I have to remind people that this is unlike any other national program, including the UK, where there's recently banter at a health, you know, at a ministry, ministerial level about data and how unreliable it is. They do not collect data in that way. They do not have a structured data collection process. And that clearly had a huge impact on how accepted those results were. In saying that, there are, of course, limitations to the data that's collected. We know, and we can tell by looking at the data and in um, after you hear from Karen today, you'll hear that you'll actually be able to look at this in even more greater detail. But most data is collected during the weekdays, and we know that. We also know that most data is collected on early shift or in, on the day shift. So I guess the questions then become, what would compliance look like if we were collecting data during the night or if we were looking at data collected on the weekends? Um, and from a national perspective, we often ask the question, is it feasible for us then to require um, a certain or a set amount of data to be collected all across the shifts or at different times? And that's probably a good question to be asking moving forward. The other thing is, is that we know that there's still this variability in individual practice. So one example that we have recently come across was in a very specific department where their compliance rate was, was about 60%. And so we were using the results that we were looking at going through. But when we went out and actually looked at the practice that was going on, we found that there was actually this huge variation. So there were people who were clearly very, very good and probably at about 90% compliance, 80 to 90%, but then there was a contingent of staff that were at about probably 40%. And so obviously their compliance was coming out somewhere in the middle, but we but we realised that in the education process, we were just hitting those high performers every time, and they weren't the people that were needing to be captured. So there is still this huge variability in individual practice, which, which is there, and, and um, the data may not be telling us. And we also know that there's still these pockets of poor compliance. Um, some departments, no matter which organisation we're looking at, their, their um, emergency departments will still have uh, significantly lower compliance rates, we know that. Um, and also um, we know in anaesthetics there's still, in, in theatre areas there's still, um, PACU or places like that, there's still this um, real pocket of poor compliance. And trying to think about how we do that. The other limitation, I don't like to call it a limitation because it's probably, it's really looking at data collection from a very um, scientific perspective. Um, perspective, if you think about it in that way. But the other limitation, of course, is this issue around Hawthorne effect. So there was a recent publication um, from Mary Lou McClaws and her colleagues that was uh, published in AGIC, which compared uh, compliance rates being collected by humans, so according to the five moments, um, and looked at, compared that to automated surveillance systems. And they found that there was a, quite a significant effect between the two. Um, the amount of data that was collected in the periods of time was very, very small. So there's only two units that the amount of data was collected in, so it was uh, difficult to make a comparison too much on that. But one of the things that we're always trying to sort of focus on and look to, and, and in particular think about whether it's an option, is this automatic surveillance options. And the reality is, is that there's still huge limitations, particularly in um, the scenario we were talking about earlier, with using data to uh, improve practice because you can't risk stratify it. So there's no, uh, no capabilities at the moment to actually report uh, uh, correctly on moment twos in particular, so around procedures. So it's a real issue with identifying which I have to say is my personal thing. I think if anyone's going to be compliant with moments looking after me, I want to make sure that their moment twos are done 
really well. <laughs> um, but the other side of this is it's really asking, coming back to this question of why we're collecting data. And as the day progresses, we'll talk more and more about that. But if we have in the past talked about the Hawthorne effect or about using that identification of problems and addressing them there and then to move practice forward. And if you uh, ha weren't able to attend our workshop last year, Narelle Dean did a really fantastic talk, which is still up on our website, it's been recorded, which talked about um, positive feedback and uh, uh, immediate feedback at the time of auditing. So it sort of buys into this idea that you're just collecting data for the sake of it, rather than actually collecting data to do something with at that point in time, at the time when you're watching what's happening with the practice. It's really, again, focusing on this idea where we're just here to collect data and tick the box and, and meet our requirements. So I guess this brings us back to the question very nicely then of what is our destination if we're trying, if we're working out whether we're there yet, what is our destination? Um, and what are we doing with our data? At HHA, we believe that our destination is patient safety and patient care. And that's what data collection is all about. So just as a reminder, I've added in the reference to monitoring and reporting from the WHO. And the reason that data collection is included as one of the main, uh, one of the essential components of that multimodal uh, program framework. And just to remind that direct observation remains the gold standard and the five moments model is valuable to aid observation in several ways. As we all know, the care activities that we provide do not follow a standard operating procedure, and so it's hard for us to always work out what those crucial moments are for hand hygiene. The five moments concept lays a reference grid over these activities and minimises the opportunities for inter-observer variation. And when we're talking about reporting, what we're actually doing is reporting results to provide strategies to improve. Um, and based on the five moments, it's possible to report risk specific hand hygiene performance in full agreement with training and promotional material. So if we think about monitoring and reporting and the way forward, there's a few questions that we think are important to ask. Why are we collecting this data? Is the data working for us? How hard are you making your data work? Or is it just you and your auditors that are doing all the hard work? We do, and Kate's going to present some further detail on this, but we have places that come to us and they are reporting monthly and they are producing compliance reports on hand hygiene that are this thick. And they spend hours and hours of their days writing these reports. The other, um, other focus that we have noticed with data collection is this concentration on continuous data collection. I get my auditors to collect 10 moments a, a week, every week. That way I get my data every, every month which is fine, we understand why people do that, but the initial uh, program was set up based on the quality cycle where you used your data to identify some of the areas for improvement, you put something in place, and then you audit it again to see if there are improvements. And we came across this terminology a few months ago where someone asked, are we just weighing the pig? So the idea is that we just keep putting the, our pig on the scales and reading what the number is, and then we put them on the next day, and we put them on the next day, and we just read these numbers over and over and over, hoping that the pig's going to get fatter and fatter and fatter, ready for the market. But what we're actually doing is nothing to make the pig any fatter. So are we focusing all our efforts on measurement and not in, on improvement? One of the biggest things that we find constantly is this obsession with collecting more data. And I have moved to challenging people to say, why are you collecting that much data? Oh, I just want, I just, you know, we just need to collect that much data. More is not better. More data is not better. And in a time where we are so resource poor, 
when it comes to having you know, resources at our fingertips, more is not better. Quality is better than quantity. We also have an obsession with more auditors. And again, Kate and Karen are going to talk about this in greater detail. But this really is about people trying, and we, you know, when we first had the program, infection control practitioners ran and did everything in their hand hygiene. They collected all the data. And it's great that that's not the case anymore, that it's been you know, pushed out to, for areas to own it themselves. But we've come to a point where some organisations will have 200 plus auditors and they don't even know who those people might be. And with that has come this real focus on ticking the data collection box. And it's, a, and, um, it's become quite a big thing in terms of the use of resources. Now, we're not saying to stop collecting data or not to collect data in the places where it's really worthwhile. In some places, you know, you might be collecting the above amount of data because you know that there's an issue with compliance there, and that's, that's absolutely fine. But I just challenge anybody who's collecting an extreme amount of data um, above what is required to actually think about your programs and think about whether that's a lot. Because at a national level in period two of this year, we received um, nearly 210,000 extra moments. So, so it's hard for us then when people tell us that we require too much data <laughs> to understand why, because everyone is giving us too much data. I get it though, because I actually think it's a lot easier to collect data than it is to change people's practice. And at least when you're collecting data, you feel like you're doing something. But I don't know that collecting data is going to get us to the destination if we don't start doing something on this other side of it. From, as I said, from our perspective, our destination is very much patient safety. And we still hear the stories, and we know ourselves when we have family members in hospitals, that we have that 80% compliance benchmark. But if you're on night duty, or if you're, in, if you're with a sick child in the emergency department overnight, you know that compliance isn't at 80%. We anecdotally hear that just as much. We know that we're making a difference to patient safety. There, has, there is a significant and a clear association between the National Hand Hygiene Initiative and the other infection control things that have gone on with that at the same time, as Lindsay mentioned, with the um, focus on moment twos. We know that that's having an impact on patient safety. But we feel our direction moving forward is really towards improvement. We very, we very much believe that the data collection box is currently ticked. We have an amazing structured program that allows us to measure the exact situation that we have in our organisations. But we think that the next step is to take that and to move towards improvement even further. As, a, as an organisation or as HHA, we would love to do more in this space. We would love to update our auditor training and validation processes to make them so much easier and so much more streamlined. We'd love to be able to do more video how-to guides, particularly on how to do different types of dating and reporting, giving feedback. We'd love to be able to get into the simulation education space and do some research on inappropriate glove use and product use and technique. We'd love to be able to do more targeted promotions. We really believe that that's the way to start it gaining some traction, particularly in those pockets where we know there's poor compliance, profession-specific or guidelines for specific settings and really look at how we can better integrate hand hygiene into all of those parts of um, work that we do around workflow, um, guidelines, uh, directions, those sorts of things. So some of the challenges I put towards you today are to really listen to the workshop sessions that we've got ahead of us. Ask yourself or, and ask us lots of questions Give us as much feedback as you can. Um, you'll hear that a lot of the work that we've done over the last 12 months has been guided well and truly by what you tell us you need and the things that will make a difference and your involvement in what we produce. 
But really, I challenge you to move your focus as we are moving ours as well towards improvement and, and challenge what you think about data collection and what your data does for you, as we do as well. Uh, that's it for me. Thank you.